meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued on March 12th of this year, this meeting will be held using remote participation. And the meeting um, is being uh, video recorded. We're gonna begin the meeting with public comment. And uh, I wanted to just mention that the public comment here should be anything other than it than what is associated with the public hearing that is coming up and uh, will occupy the bulk of the meeting. Does anyone wish to speak? Um, and also all of those, please um, mute yourselves unless you're speaking, thank you. Can you repeat what you just said about the public comment now? Um, we are entering a public comment period, but uh, we're limiting the public comment to anything uh, other than uh, what is going to be discussed at the public hearing, which is going, going to be coming up shortly and we'll take up the bulk of the meeting. I don't hear any uh, requests for public comment. Uh, we will move on to the next item, which is um, the approval of the minutes. Again, please mute yourself if you uh, are not speaking. Thank you. I would uh, yeah. uh, see any problem with the minutes, Mrs. Barbara. I would move to accept the minutes. These are the minutes from November 30th. I have a couple little things. Um, I, I'm mar not marked as present at the top. I was present. That's reflected in the in the minutes themselves. Sorry about that. It's okay. And then. Um, Further down in determination of significance for 254 Old Wilson Road, it has me both moving and seconding. Um, I believe I seconded, but I did not make the initial motion. I don't recall. I might have done that. I don't know. You can put me down as having. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. The motion. I think I did. Uh, whoever has a child in the background, if you could please mute yourself unless you're speaking. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to take a vote on this? Any, there's no more discussion, I gather. Any a vote on it? Uh, so Sarah? Martha? Yes. Barbara? Oh, yes. <laughs> Dylan? Yes. Craig? Yes. Thank you. We will move on to the public hearing and um, we are officially opening it at this hour. I don't have a clock in front of me. Sarah, I'm assuming you do. And um, this public hearing is to determine whether the building at 61 Warner Street, which is map ID 23D-083, should be determined preferably preserved pursuant to the Northampton Demolition Review Ordinance Chapter 161 of the General Code. Um, as probably many of you recall and is in the minutes, the commission found that the building met criteria C and D as such was determined to be a significant building and the commission must now determine whether it would be in the public interest to be preserved rather than demolished. Uh, I wanted to just review with the commission and also for the interests of those present tonight. In the ordinance, um, there is a list of evidence that can be gathered in order to make this determination. And I just wanted to spell the evidence out, there are nine different items. So the first is uh, what is the current condition of the building or structure? Second, how intact is the building or structure? Third, what is the age of the building or structure? 
Fourth is the building or structure an exemplary, exemplary representation of a certain style or period. And if so, how many of those exist? What is the building or structure's role in the streetscape? Are there exemplary construction elements that embody distinctive characteristics of a period? Does the building or structure yield important information about history? Has the building or structure been designed by a famous or local architect? Has the building or structure been removed from its original location? And if so, does it still have architectural value or is the surviving structure importantly associated with a historic person or event? Uh, in reviewing uh, this evidence, it just um, I wanted to just remind the commission members that we do not have to um, determine that the majority of this evidence is um, necessary to make this determination. So for example, if a building is really, really um, important to history, let's say, but it doesn't meet, it doesn't really fulfill the other evidence that we're looking for, that doesn't mean that we would not consider it to be preferably preserved. So um, this evidence is not weighed uh, one by one, it doesn't have to be a majority of the nine items, it could be one, it could be all. Um, before we proceed with this, I just want to remind all of those who are in attendance and also especially the commissioners as well as the um, public, the commission cannot review, comment on, approve or deny what is proposed for this site. We can only decide whether it believes it is in the best interest of the public for the structure to be properly preserved, preserved and there, therefore recommend that demolition will be, um, should be delayed. So it is not our purview to uh, do any commenting on what is proposed. And um, from what I'm uh, told uh, by the city, uh, there have been no plans for this site um, submitted to the city to date. Uh, I also wanted to just mention that the chat is open. I think all of you know how to use that. Um, this is only going to be accessible to the planning staff and the commission members. Um, so I'm not encouraging people to try to attempt a dialogue because um, it won't be possible to do that. But we will review all of your comments that come in. Um, this hearing has been advertised by the city website. And um, just again, for people's um, information, demolition permit um, reviews are not uh, subject to having a butters notified if there's a public hearing because demolition is considered to be a citywide issue. It's not just a, a butter issue. So therefore there's no a butter um, uh, contact. Um, so I'd like to act on the procedure, how we're going to um, proceed here tonight with this hearing. Um, one will ask for any staff updates since the last meeting, which was on the 30th of November. Then we'll ask the applicant or the applicant's uh, representative to make a presentation. So just review with us again what is proposed. At that point, the public will be invited to speak. And I ask that you take your, leave your comments to two to three minutes, which is what a standard that the city council uses. And um, please do not try to repeat what others have said going before you. Um, we'll enter any letters that have been received by the city into the public record. And then the applicant um, is asked to respond to any of the public comments. The commissioners will ask questions if they have any, and then the public hearing will close. So that is the process we're going to use. With that, I'd like to start. Um, Sarah, I don't believe there are any staff updates since the last meeting. Is that correct? Correct. Right. There are none. Okay. Is there a representative present uh, for the applicant? There is Ryan O'Hare of Bacon Wilson on behalf of New Way Homes and New Way Homes principal John Hanzel is here as well, but I'll be presenting. Okay, great, Ryan and John, thank you. Why don't you go ahead? Awesome. All right. So again, my name is Ryan O'Hare. I work for Bacon Wilson and I work for New Way Homes as its, uh, as its attorney, but I'm also a Northampton resident, live at 76 Pleasant Street. 
so we're here tonight for the demolition delay ordinance review by this body on the application for a demolition permit for 61 Warner Street submitted to the building commissioner. And, you know, as you've correctly pointed out, Ms. Lyon, I won't restate kind of the evidence that the board's to consider tonight, but I will just, you know, point out again, the overall inquiry the board's doing, which is under the definition section, determining whether this is a preferentially preserved, excuse me, preferably preserved structure. Uh, and that's defined as, as weighing whether basically the historical value of whatever the structure is outweighs and, and the public interest in that value essentially outweighs whatever public benefits might be brought by its demolition. It's all about the public interest ultimately. And that's the public at large. That's the city of Northampton. So, you know, with that in mind, I think what I'd like to do is first just kind of talk about the structure that is there. And then, you know, just for the, for the sake of the board uh, or the commission rather, go into the specifics of, of our argument basically on, on why we think the, it's in the best interest of the city to demolish the structure. Uh, I do have some uh, photographs that I would like to share if possible. I know that Sarah had said that she was gonna enable me to screen share and that may well be the case. I am something of a screen share novice, so. Um, it, it should be all said now. Okay, I, I should be able to do this seamlessly, but if I can't, I apologize to everyone. Oh. It looks good. All right, can everyone see uh, a photo of a house? Yeah. All right, all right. So this is, and it'll be familiar, I know, to the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I started moving it, to the neighbors, but the, the structure at 61 Warner. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of go down through this. We're starting with the exterior shots, uh, just to give you a sense of, of this house. I'd say it's a pretty typical um, single family home there are not really, as you'll see, maybe I'll tell you what I, what I see here before I scroll through. I see a pretty typical single family home. It is old, um, certainly. It's not in the best shape. I will point out some specifics as I go through, but um, you know, the, the bones of this structure do seem to be struggling a little bit. You've got a lot of warped uh, edges, you know, some significant disrepair on the outside, but also just in terms of the evidence the board's looking for, what you're not going to see here are any architecturally significant features. You're not going to see anything that is period distinctive. You're gonna see a house that's a very typical single family home with vinyl siding and you know some, some disrepair issues. Now it does have the one piece maybe is a slate roof uh, as I'm kind of indicating here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Now that slate roof though is in pretty bad shape. Uh, one thing you can see kind of in this picture here is and it's a little more prominent in, in person, but some warping along the edge of this roof here. Uh, you can see that same kind of phenomenon again, not super clearly, but along here. And then, it, you know, just other than that, you're, you're looking at a pretty typical property. And I just would emphasize to the board that what, what you're looking for today is what's atypical, right? It's, it's things that are significant. It's things that are really, really jumping out. There's none of that here in the structure. Now starting to move inside, you know, it goes from what is outside, something that could use a little repair, but looks pretty good on the whole, to, to just seeing what the state of this structure is. And that's really total disrepair at this point. So, you know, now moving into the interior, see kind of the main living area. This brick and any brick you see in the house is uh, imitation. It, it, it's, it's not real brick. There's uh, you know, the plastic drop ceilings, that's in pretty bad repair, just more of the kitchen. Uh, and then something I really wanna point out here as we, as we go through this, that's kind of more the same is now getting into the real bones of the house. Again, these are just some bedrooms, not great shape, totally demolished bathroom here. Um, but of real note are these pictures, this one here especially. You heard some testimony at the first hearing uh, that this house must be built with some hyper unique construction method. And it, that testimony in the letter that associated, I believe it was from Mr. Combs or, or Combs, I apologize if, you, if I mispronounce, uh, was that their home had had some unique building structure. So certainly this one did too. Well, as you can see in the walls here, that's just simply not the case. This is just typical insulation framing construction. There's nothing unique or special 
about the bones of this house or the construction method. Uh, I'm gonna end my screen share now because really that's all, that's all there is to see with this structure. There's not some fascinating period field stone basement. There's not unique interior flourishes. There's not unique architecture to it. It really is a, a ordinary house that served ordinary people very well. And, th and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that what the commission needs to be looking at today is exactly this. In determining whether it's preferably preserved, understanding that you've already made a determination of historical significance, that analysis needs to be done in light of what that historical significance is. And I think a fair summary of the historical significance that got presented to this board, setting aside whatever theories of unique construction might have existed that you've now seen are not the case, it really amounts to the fact that this was a home that housed a mill worker starting in the late 1800s. And other than that, there's really nothing historically significant about this structure in particular, not a single thing. And the, the history of Bay State Village, the history of the cutlery factory, I can tell you who the cutlery worker who worked here in 1870, lived here in the early 1870s, mid 1870s, was his name was Joseph Day. Came here from England, Cutler's apprentice, uh, developed his craft, worked at the factory. A couple generations of the family lived there and eventually they sold it. Those are the people to whom this structure would have the most history, would have the most significance, would have the most value. They let it go. Served another family well for some time. They let it go, ultimately it was uh, sold by the heirs of, of some others to where it is now. So you're not talking about some place that has a meaningful connection with a historical figure of broader importance within the city, within the region, anything like that. So in determining whether this structure is preferably preserved, you need to determine that in light of the, yes, the categories of evidence that can be collected, but also what is the strength of the evidence of its historical significance, which I would suggest is very, very limited. That this home has maybe some tangential connection to history, but that does not make it a important site of historical preservation. And to just briefly run through some of these categories of evidence that you're you know, to consider tonight. Well, we've just talked quite extensively about the current condition of the building or structure. And the simple answer is it's not good. Now, could this structure hypothetically be rehabilitated? In theory, yes, but it's unclear what end that would serve anyone other than it being, once again, an occupied single family home. There's no proposition that this is gonna be part of some museum or something like that. This is really just a single family home. Uh, when you talk about the age of it, yes, it's old, but that's just about it because really the rest of these categories talk about things like exemplary construction elements. There's simply not that here. The building or structure itself yielding important information about history. Anyone driving by this house or down this street would not take note of this structure in any way. They wouldn't learn something from it. Now, that's not to say there's not interesting historical details you can find out when you go digging and looking for all sorts of information. I mean, I, I will admit, me digging in and doing the research and learning about that Joseph Day and his life in the Cutlery Factory, it was interesting. But would that have ever happened if I wasn't a lawyer representing someone in this hearing? No, no person in the city of Northampton, no one walking by is going to learn, glean, or even suspect any sort of historical import or information from this structure. There was a suggestion that the home was built by Porter Nutting. Now, if that's true, which I don't know that there's been solid evidence whatsoever produced of that. That's one standard here. And the same allegation that this was built by Porter Nutter said that there were three other identical homes right there. So you're not even talking about losing a category of this thing. And that's a critical element that comes up in these, in these body or in these categories of evidence that you're supposing to be considering. So take number four. Is the building or structure an exemplary representation of a certain style or period? Well, I'd suggest to you the answer to that is no. But even if you answered it yes, the question then becomes, and if so, how many of those exist? Well, you've been told that to the extent this is any sort of special or significant structure, 
there's three identical ones right nearby. All of these, when you look really at the factors you're supposed to be considering, militate against preserving this building. And then I would like to close just by talking about the broader public good, the public interest. What serves the city and the citizens of Northampton better? Preserving this rundown single family home for a year, locking up three buildable lots in a time when we desperately need more housing in the city based on tangential historical importance uh, that, that just is not self-evident, that no member of the public of Northampton would ever identify, learn anything from, gain any value from? Or is the better thing for the public interest allowing someone who's coming in, trying to make the city better, demolish this home, have three buildable lots, and be able to have housing stock that this city desperately, desperately needs? So when you're talking about the public interest, yes, are, are there small historical connections and details that one can draw out and make and tie to this property? Naturally. But if you apply the standard that's being requested here and say that this structure is something that should be preferably preserved, you're essentially saying that every home in Northampton that's in the vicinity of a mill that is over 100 years old, any home has enough historical value to be preferably preserved. And that's just not a sensible approach for a consistent application of this ordinance to the city, to the city in particular in Northampton, to cities throughout New England, that doesn't make sense because the reality of our history here in New England and here in Northampton is we were mill towns a hundred years ago and times change and we grow and no one here is asking to raise the mill. We're talking about a home that is otherwise unremarkable that a mill worker lived in at one point. And that is simply not the intent of this ordinance. It doesn't serve the public good to do. And we therefore would request that you find it is not preferably preserved. And uh, I'll, at this point, I'll let the neighbors speak and I'm happy to return and address any issues after the fact. Okay, thank you, Ryan. John, do you want to say anything as the applicant? No, I think Ryan put everything perfectly well. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to invite the public to speak and just to, uh, a couple things. One, please state your name and your address. And also to remind you, please keep your comments to two, three minutes um, and try not to repeat what others have said. Chris. You're still muted. <laughs> still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. And, and you can still hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Thompson and I uh, live at 41 Warner Street. Um, I have a few corrections for Mr. O'Hare at the end of what my statement here, but um, Porter Nutting uh, bought land from Samuel Hill, a prominent abolitionist, and built four identical houses in a row on Warner Street between the years of 1860 and 1865. He sold what's now 61 in November of 1862 to James Riley. This is the oldest of the four houses and very likely the oldest house on the entire street. Two and a half years ago, my partner and I bought 41 Warner Street and proceeded with an extensive house renovation. The house was in considerably worse condition than 61 Warner Street is. We were both in 61 Warner Street in this, this summer and were able to do a full assessment of its condition. It absolutely does not need to be demolished. During the renovation of 41 Warner, I found a framing technique that I'd never seen before in my 23 years uh, doing restoration carpentry and general contracting. I was so surprised that I called in help from my mentor, Steve Striebel, to help me figure out what was going on. Steve Striebel is a master restoration carpenter and mason with decades of knowledge and extensive resume involving significant properties throughout New England. He has also worked for both Historic Deerfield and also Historic New England. In 2018, he came to assess 41 Warner Street, which is identical to 61 Warner Street. 
Mr. Strebel is in his 70s with a 50 plus year career in historic preservation. And he said that he had never seen this building technique used in Western Mass and only very rarely in Eastern Mass. The house was built post and beam with no studs. The, in, the inside, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, with no studs. Instead, Porter Nutting used mortared bricks to support the frame. Inside, the structural brick was parged for smooth walls. The exterior only had one layer, which was vertical board and batten. This gave the house a Gothic cottage look. Gothic style architecture was very popular and fashionable at this time. William Fenno Pratt, a famous local architect, built many structures in our area in this style. Porter Nutting owned a brickyard around the corner. It was, and it was the Civil War era and materials might have been scarce or expensive. Maybe this is why he built the houses this way. Regardless, they are, they are a unique example of ingenuity and engineering. Around the corner, a few streets over, Florence is in the process of creating a historic district based on cultural significance. This approach could easily be used for the Baker Hill section of, of Bay State Village, as well as Paper Mill Village nearby on Federal Street. The architecture in that neighborhood dates from the mid 18th century and hosts a wide array of early mill worker housing. There is a rich history of mill life that current residents still remember. Losing this house at 61 Warner to demolition would be an irreparable loss to the architectural and cultural history of Bay State Village. And I would like to respond uh, just two things to uh, that Mr. O'Harris uh, mentioned. Uh, this is, he, he has no professional business uh, trying to come across with any kind of um, uh, complex uh, knowledge of 19th century framing techniques. Uh, and I will respond to one of his photos where he showed an open exterior wall as proof that what I'm saying is not true. And the wall that was opened is actually part of an addition that was put on later and not part of the main uh, original block. Okay. And thank you, uh, everyone, very thank much. You, Chris, um, and uh, a next comment. Anyone? Hmm. Uh, is I, uh, Mark Jarvis would like to speak. Okay, Mark, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Jarvis. I live at uh, 84 Warner Street. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Hara. Um, I was a little surprised, uh, Mr. O'Hara, to hear you speaking so expertly on history, social history, architecture. Um, um, I doubt that you are qualified in those subjects. I don't practice law. I don't expect you to practice those things at a meeting which is so important to the local residents. So I think we can ignore your expertise in that area whilst admiring your skills uh, in, in, in the legal sphere perhaps, sphere, perhaps. You started off describing this building as a typical family home in the area. Are we then to assume that anything that replaces it, that looks different to it, is going to be atypical? Or when that time comes around, Will people hold up what Mr. Hansel intends to build as something which is entirely in keeping with the neighborhood, which fits in perfectly well? I think the building that's there is the building that should remain there. That's the building that makes its contribution to the history, the lifestyle, the flavor, the nature of Bay State Village. And Bay State Village is important to yeah. all of Northampton. It's part of the color of Northampton as a whole. Each neighborhood has its own flavors, its own distinctive style. Bay State has its distinctive style and squeezing four a typical, three or four a typical buildings onto that tiny lot does not serve our neighborhood well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else? 
Uh, yeah. I have a... Can you hear anybody hear me? Uh, please identify yourself. I'm, I'm Doug Rosa. I live on 73 Hinkley, which is about four doors down from that house on the corner of Warner. And uh, what Mark just said is I'm in total agreement with Bay State as a whole is a very Um, I think uh, we're having a sound problem. We, we lost you, Doug. Am I there now? Yes. Oops, okay. Um, and Doug, excuse part, me, just to clarify, are you also identified with Diane Fabeg? Yeah, that's my wife uh, logged on and, you know, we're, we're, she's my wife. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to be clear okay. about it. Thank you. Um, Bay State's a very old neighborhood and you expect to have a real mix of houses. I mean, anywhere from the house on the corner, which is supposedly the oldest house in the neighborhood up to my house, which was built in the fifties, a typical ranch house. So then there's a wide variety of architecture on the street. And I don't, from my point of view, maybe I'm in the wrong meeting, but I don't blame the builder for what's going on here. I blame the city allowing this sort of new construction to occur in an established neighborhood. I mean, Bay State has been around for a long time and um, I was part of the meeting that, that occurred uh, on Hinkley early on when Jonathan Wright uh, built eight condos up the street, demolished one single family house and uh, put in place eight condos, okay? And that to me was the start of what I regard as a very bad trend that's now occurring in my neighborhood, which is builders coming in, finding old houses that are in disrepair, regardless of their significance or regardless of the location, tearing them down and then replacing them with two or three or four, how many houses they can cram into a lot because of this city's uh, new zoning ordinance about infill, allowing the reduction of building lots and uh, reduction of frontage and all, the, all this other stuff that goes on to infill. And what's gonna happen to my neighborhood is gonna be an, an irreparable change in my neighborhood from a funky old neighborhood with a lot of architecture from a lot of different eras into a more unified architecture with all these contractor houses that are all look the same, two-story colonials, uh, which to me is very ironic because the city's infill began when they were trying to uh, stop the development out on Route 66 of these uh, you know, far, far, you know, the suburban uh, um, uh, uh, projects that were far, you know, removed from the city, center city. Uh, all, all very similar in architecture. They said, well, this is not good having all these suburban sprawls going on. And now they're li lively promote the same thing in my neighborhood by allowing these builders to come in, tear down old houses and build these new modern structures, all of which look very similar. So to me, it's, it's doing a ripple of a harm to my neighborhood just by allowing builders. And I'm not blaming the builder. He's just following the rules. The rules were set up by the city, okay? He's following the rules. So perhaps, you know, the city is really to blame here. Um, but it's just a shame that they're going to come in here and find you know, to cherry picking different lots and saying, hey, well, there's an old house, you know, in disrepair and nice big wide, you know, uh, got a lot of acreage, uh, a lot of frontage. Or we, can, we can cram in two or three houses in this place. And what's going to happen to Bay State? This continues on because once this is allowed, and I think the, the, the development that Jonathan Wright put in four years ago, was sort of the, the open the door to this whole change. What's going to happen in the neighborhood if this if this if this carries on uh, without any sort of uh, you know uh, ability to say no, enough is enough. So that that's my point. And maybe this is not really historical what I'm saying here, but I but as a as a resident of Bay State for 28 years, um, I learned to appreciate the neighborhood and all its funkiness. And I hate to see that funkiness disappear. Uh, under the uh, the aegis of the city of seating, deciding that we need to infill, we need more housing, and therefore we're going to bend the rules on zoning and cram in as many houses as we can, because that just impacts everybody in my neighborhood. Doug, thank you very much. And I just want to restate, um, you are correct. This is not uh, something the Historical Commission is, is not under a preview, purview to regulate um, the uh, issues that you are talking about, those are issues for the planning board and the planning department. I understand. Um, and, you know, we register your comments. I know a lot of you have had those comments and they've come to us by email and by letter. We appreciate that. However, we do have to stick with uh, what is in front of us. 
which is trying to decide about this particular structure. I understand. So, and yeah. I recognize that I'm just ranting, I, but I, you know, uh, and I just want to, you know, I just wanted to tune into this meeting and see what was happening. But, uh, you know, Mr. O'Hara presented a very good case, but as uh, Mark said, he's not an architect. And of course he's going to present a case to demolish the house because that's, he's representing the builder. So you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really, you know, buying what he's saying as being, being very honest. But that's just me. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? And please stick with your, please keep, uh, keep your comments to the issue at hand. Um, I have Catherine and Mary, and Deborah. <laughs> so who wants to go first? Mary, how about you? You're on top. <laughs> and please unmute yourself. Hi, my name's Mary Clark. I live at 183 Riverside. So my house backs up to Warner Street um, in the block in which the house in which 61 is. I'm between Hinckley and Federal on Riverside Drive. And I just wanted to say that I truly appreciate the commission in looking at this. Um, our Hall of Records was destroyed. There's a lot that we don't know about houses in Bay State Village. My house was maybe built in 1885. And hearing what Chris has said uh, and understanding the mill, uh, the fact that this was a mill area, I'm right next to the Fiker house where Mayor Fiker lived. And what's the problem with delaying for a year to try to find out all we can about this house? I, I am totally in favor of delaying a demolition to find out what we can find out. Um, we won't have a chance to find it out if we don't. If it gets demolished, we've lost that opportunity. We won't have the opportunity to build it again. Decide if it should be moved. Decide anything about it. So I'm in favor of delaying to learn everything we can about the house. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you, Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Commodore. I live at 129 Warner Street up the hill. Um, I also want to thank the Historical Commission for this hearing. Um, um, the, the first thing that I just wanted to say was I'm kind of, I was kind of stunned to hear what Mr. O'Hara said um, uh, and, and how little value he put on the fact that this was a Civil War era house and also how little value he put on the fact that it was a working person's house. Um, I, I also live in one of the old mill style workers houses here um, and I value it greatly. I value the whole history of this street and the mill workers houses on this street and including 61 Warner. I've loved hearing what Chris has told us about this house. I value that. I value that about living here. And so I, I, I was kind of shocked to hear that um, kind of thrown in the trash like that because it matters to me. It matters to me. Um, as I said, um, at the, the, the meeting a couple of weeks ago when we purchased our house, it was also in a state of disrepair. It was in the deep bargain basement. We paid very little for it. It was in not very good shape. It had been neglected for a long time. And the first meeting with our architect, he recommended that we tear it down because that would be our best value. And we had no interest in tearing it down. No interest, and I have no interest in seeing 61 torn down at all. Um, the, it, um, Chris has said that it can be repaired. I trust him. <laughs> he knows what he's doing, it seems like, with this. And um, that uh, it would, I, I would love to see somebody take care of that house and steward it back to life again. That's what I love about our neighborhood. That's what I value about our neighborhood. So um, um, I feel like Northampton was built on the backs of the folks that lived in these houses. That's really important. They're, they're not they're not fancy Elm Street houses from fancy builders, but um, the whole city was built on the backs of these families here. That really matters. Matters to me. So I I also would like to um, see the demolition delayed. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Deborah. Hi, um, my name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live at 41 Warner and I have written something and I would appreciate, I think it's gonna take more than two or three minutes, but I think since Mr. O'Hara spent quite a bit of time, I'd actually like the time to 
um, present the information that I have. And I'd also like to say that one of the things that's wonderful about this neighborhood is that many, many people who walk by actually do know about the history of the houses and it matters deeply to us. And we, and we do know, we, we do have the, the, uh, the data about them. So um, I wanna thank the commission. I want, want to speak really specifically to why this house should be deemed preferably preserved according to criteria C and specifically that it's importantly associated with the broad architectural, cultural, political, economic, or social history of the city or the Commonwealth. And so I'm going to actually give a little history lesson about Bay State and about this house. Northampton was a place of, of industry. We moved rivers, we built large factories, and we housed the many workers who came here for economic and social opportunity. Bay State was at the very center of this industry and our architecture is a reflection of it. So we had the paper mill village in the 18th century and then we had a large mill complex in Bay State uh, that was various versions of the Bay State tool manufacturing, Bay State hardware company. And uh, when this group of houses was built during the Civil War, 81% of the cutlery in the United States was made in plants in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And our first union uh, in Northampton was the uh, Grinders Association and the one of the residents uh, during the year that that was done, uh, one of the residents of 61 Warner was a grinder. We also had Warner Silk Mill in Bay State and other silk mills in Florence and mulberry trees were grown on Warner Street across from 61 Warner to supply the silkworms with food and there's still a mulberry tree there. The first worker housing that was built was built in 1852. There was a letter written home to a worker from Connecticut who talked about the brick, brick dormitory known as the Block and Riverside Drive. And the mill owners of those, of those mills um, owned the, the other side of Baker Hill from Warner Street. They started to put in streets and mark out lots and build houses and they held the mortgages for them. And between 1860 and 1865, when this house was built on Liberty Street, 10 of those houses were built there. And at the same time, on the other side of Baker Hill, there was a splitting off of lots on Warner Street heading up the hill. But the difference here was that workers were able to buy their own houses without company ownership and financing. The original ho house uh, in this area, ironically, was 170 Federal Street, which unfortunately Mr. Hensel also owns. And Porter Nutting owned and purchased a significant amount of land between what is now Nonatuck Street, where his brickyard was, and Warner Street. He owned land on the south side of Warner, and in 1860, he purchased five acres from Samuel Hill on the north side of the street. And he proceeded to build four houses that are all still standing from 61 Warner eastward to 35 Warner. They were the first houses on the street. Um, Chris gave the dates between November 24th and 1862 and November 1st, 1865. And for decades, these, these were the only houses that stood on the north side of the street. They were a significant block in and of themselves. And in 1895, there was still nothing behind these houses. So what we have is we have a spurt of development in the 1860s spearheaded by Porter Nutting, and then the street remained the same for many decades. So these houses were prominent and they were a tight community socially and architecturally. Myself and many others have spent dozens and dozens of hours, uh, both now and in the past, researching the deeds on these properties, the city directories. Thank you, Jacob, very good marking. I really want to thank Jackie Balance and Steve Strymer also for their help. So I can tell you that regarding 61 Warner Street, I can say with almost total certainty that Lafayette never slept here. <laughs> but who did sleep in this house and in the matching three houses were people who moved here from England, Ireland and Germany for a better life to take advantage of the opportunities presented by employment in a growing industrial town and the ability to own their own ho homes replete with enough land to raise animals and crops to feed their families. Interesting. They were machinists, Cutlers, these were the people who lived there, machinists, cutlers, grinders, polishers, brick masons, stone masons, farmers, and later police officers, clerks, and stenographers. They were the people who built Northampton physically, economically, and culturally, and they suffered for it. When one looks at the homeowners on Warner Street, there's a disproportionate number of widows, likely widowed by what was called in Bay State grinders pneumonia. One of the nutting houses, number 35, was purchased by James and Hannah Slattery. She was not literate from Ireland. He was a stonemason who died at 51 of bronchial disease and she died at 55 of quote exhaustion. John Vogel of 53 Warner Street, these are Porter Nutting's houses, a German farmer was widowed at a young age. John Bay of 61 Warner was a machinist and he died at age 55 and early death goes on and on. And they also fought for their city. The house of 53 Warner was purchased from Porter Nutting by Michael Merrick, a laborer from Ireland who enlisted in the Union Army. 
at age 38 last five months after he purchased the house in Porter Nutting and happily he returned to the house after the war. So only three families have lived at 61 Warner Street over the course of 158 years until Mr. Hansel bought it to demolish it. And that's actually pretty extraordinary in our city's history. In 1862, Porter Nutting sold the house to James and Carolyn Riley, who had both emigrated from England. He was a machinist and he and his teenage sons and daughter all worked in a machine shop together, presumably in Bay State. The house was owned for 15 years back and forth between their, uh, they were siblings, uh, sisters in the fa family. Um, the other family was Elijah Chase's family. He was a mason who worked with his son, Frederick, and there's a form B on Frederick's second empire house in Florence. In 1879, the house entered the Day family where it remained for 87 years. Charlotte Day, and I want people to listen to this, Charlotte Day, born in England, purchased the house on her own, even though she was married. And the deed says to Charlotte Day, wife of Joseph Day, in her own name and her own name says, in separate you. use. And this was very unusual at the time. She was not literate, and yet she was able to purchase the house, as well as a lot on Norwood Avenue for one of her sons. Her husband was a knife grinder in England before emigrating, uh, predeceased her by 20 years, and multiple generations of days lived at 61 Warner. She had a son, John Day, also born in England, who was a steel polisher, and her granddaughters wove braided rugs. Charlotte Day, interestingly, created infill with the building of another house on the lot for family members. That's now the, that's now the house that is on Hinckley Street behind this one. And it was the kind of infill that I supported when the zoning regulations were passed. The infill that I supported was not Mr. Hansel's version of infill, which is to fill in every possible bit of land and leave nothing else standing. So one of the day sons purchased another nutting house two doors away. And again, what I'm trying to say here is that this was a tight interwoven community for our houses. And so Mr. O'Hara's claim that if we get rid of one, it doesn't really matter. That was not how that house has functioned historically in this neighborhood. The last owners of the house were the Raymonds for 56 years, and they were ordinary people living ordinary lives. But cumulatively, they and their houses reflect exactly what this ordinance was designed to protect, especially Criteria C. Why should their history and legacy be any less valuable, any less necessary to protect than grander homes built literally or through profit created by these very residents? Even temporarily standing in the way of demolition of this house shows respect for the lower wage warners who actually did the work to build this town. These houses are the epitome of vernacular architecture and the still existing streetscape is the epitome of mid 19th century mill village life. Bay State is still a perfect snapshot of a 100, 170 year old historic mill village. We could be on a historic registry and we should be on a historic registry to protect ourselves from developers who see only the houses and yards here as dollar signs, not as something to be preserved to remind us of where we came from. This neighborhood with its architectural, cultural, political, economic, social, and I would add landscape history is the very thing that makes Northampton unique. It is why people are banging down the doors to move here. But once the existing fabric has been demolished and we are left with identical new way homes covering our landscape and Bay State and throughout Northampton, the uniqueness will be gone. The history will be gone and we can never get it back. We drive by the corner of Old South and Con Streets and we wonder why there's a last remaining elm tree. The mid 18th century Noah Parsons Jr. house shaded by that beautiful tree was demolished not that long ago to expand the parking lot for the convenience store. The early 19th century home of a prominent abolitionist Erastus Hopkins was demolished to expand the parking lot of the St. Elizabeth and Seton Parish on King Street. And these were grand 18th and early 19th century homes owned by prominent people that ultimately we were still not able to protect. We look back at the pictures of Cosme and Hall in the center of Florence and wonder how such a beautiful building could be lost. Uh, Doug, uh, if you could, uh, Doug, Doug, can you mute, please? Uh, in the not too distant future, not just those of us in this meeting today, but the broader community, the broader people who are served by the public interest, will be shaking our heads at how we lost Bay State Village, how we lost the affordability of our modest housing stock how we lost our open lots that unconsciously allowed us to breathe a little more easily, how we lost the trees that provided habitat and helped to protect our fragile planet, how we lost our charm, our history, how we allowed a form of vulture capitalism, telling us that one has to maximize every possible dollar from a piece of property, regardless of the cost to neighbors who have lived here and paid taxes and invested our incomes into our houses over decades regardless of the cost to the community of removing and not replacing housing that is financially accessible to people who live here and work here at regular paying jobs, regardless of the cost to the city of losing what made it unique, regardless of the cost to the environment of tearing down houses and building ever larger 
chemically laden, carbon heavy houses dependent on fossil fuel. Mr. Henzel and I don't see the same things when we look at 61 Warner Street. I've told you what I see. He sees an impediment to a building lot that will yield large personal profit. I would like to suggest that just because one can do something doesn't mean one should. And how much profit is enough? He claims that he needs to build three houses on the lot to quote, make the numbers work. What are these numbers? Why isn't 25,000 or 50,000 or even $100,000 enough of a profit? Why does a single project, and he has many of these at once, need to yield hundreds of thousands of dollars or well over a million dollars when that profit is at the expense of real people actually harmed in real ways by his projects? And these projects aren't benign. They are rending the fabric of our community, the fabric of our community, of our homes, of our peace of mind and well being, and they're annihilating our history. There are alternatives to demolition through communication and collaboration per the demolition statute. That is what the demolition statute is looking to have happen in a year, not to just have Mr. Henzel sit on this. One solution is to build a single additional house on the lot and leave the existing house that's there. Frankly, with his plan, he can build two houses and leave that house still there. But the best case scenario for the public good is to leave the whole property as it is, recoup his expenses and walk away. I know people who would happily buy this house I know someone who wanted to buy it, who is exactly what what this what what people are looking for with housing in this city, a first time home buyer who could only buy a house in that in that price range and would live in it and fix it up slowly as many of us in this meeting did in order to be able to afford a house in Northampton. I'm almost done, thank you. It is heartbreaking to me that this commission does not have the ability to permanently stop demolitions. But even if it's only temporary, I for one will not stand by and be quiet as we lose these critical pieces of our history. Hubris, pure hubris, for somebody to come along, especially somebody who's not of this community, and demolish the history of the local history that is in a permanent location under the city of Jane. And look at how many times the federal people. Deborah, your microphone is um, your microphone is fading out. I think we're not hearing you. I don't know where you left me off here. Uh, I'll go back and say it is heartbreaking to me that this that this commission does not have the ability to permanently stop demolitions. But even if it's only temporary, I for one will not stand by and be quiet as we lose these critical pieces of our history. It is hubris, sheer hubris for someone to come along and demolish a house rich in local history that has been at a prominent location for 158 years. Look at 170 Federal Street. It was our other prominent house up on a hill. Is this what we want for the public good of Northampton? Where is the respect for this community, for the people who lived here in the past and who live here currently? What is the value of preserving a history that can never be regained? And Steve Strymer, who's devoted more time to preserving the history of Florence and especially its incredible history of racial and gender equity, said to me yesterday, it is like losing a tooth out of your mouth. You lose one tooth and then another tooth and eventually there's a mouth with no teeth left. We can never get back what we lose each time that a house in Bay State is demolished. And I hope that you decide to deem 61 Warner Street preferably preserved. And I thank you for your service to our city. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks very much. Anybody else? Uh, is it Reyes? I just thank you to everybody here and to the committee. I just want to take the concept of history to the future for a second. To ask a question to the historical committee. Is there any way that under your view of history, you can consider the social history of a neighborhood and its, its dedication to what Mr. Ryan, thank you, Mr. Ryan, you have given us a definition of Bay State, a neighborhood that builds ordinary houses that serve ordinary people. What a good description for Bay State. Can the committee look at history towards the future? Can you think that part of the history of our neighborhood is not just simply preserving a house or a history that is gone, but very much a history that serves the public good? And I leave you with this question. What does the serve the public good better? To build ordinary houses for ordinary people or houses that ordinary people cannot afford? Thank you, Reds. Thank you so Anybody else? I do. I'd like to say something. Holly and then Alex. My name's Holly. I live at 139 Riverside Drive. 
I have been a long time Bay State um, resident, 64 out of my 67 years. I bought the house, my house from my family's estate. So we've been here since the um, 19, late 1940s. So I wanna say um, I have a little bit of history here and I wanna support all the speakers um, that are asking for the delay uh, based on what I have heard and what has been presented tonight. And I implore you to listen to what they have been talking about when you um, look at um, their recommendations and you make the recommendations to develop into this um, house a little bit further about saving it. And that's, I'll use my last minute. So Deborah um, had more of them, right? Thank you, Holly. Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Jarrett. I'm the city councilor for Ward 5, uh, which Bay State is in. Um, first wanted to, uh, on behalf of a constituent who couldn't make it, Anna Alter, who lives at 176 Federal Street, uh, says, uh, I would like to see the Historical Commission preserve the house at 60 Mount 1 Warner. It's a beautiful property, and I would not like to see it torn down and more new houses packed in. And then a comment from me, um, there's a great example of a success with our de demolition delay ordinance uh, nearby at 205 Nonatuck Street. And um, I encourage Mr. Hansel to work with the neighborhood to find a design that allows the house to be preserved and to build additional units. Um, these are very, they are very much needed, and I, but I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think we can save the history of the neighborhood and have, add houses that fit into that neighborhood. So oh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bill Ryan, and then Jackie. Hi, I'm Bill Ryan and I live at 129 Warner Street. And um, I urge you to determine tonight that it is a preferably preserved building, the house at 61 Warner. Uh, the demolition ordinance in its definition of the term preferably preserved building or structure uh, as a uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the lawyer uh, said, lays out only one criterion for your decision tonight. And that is for the 61 Warner House, do you determine that it is quotations in the public interest to be preserved rather than demolished? Uh, we've heard the long list of subjects of evidence that could be gathered uh, that the people have been going over, but there are no other criteria for the decision you're making in the ordinance according to the definition. So that brings up the question, what is public interest? Uh, and uh, I couldn't find a definition in the North Captain Code of Ordinances nor anywhere in the laws of Massachusetts, but Black's Law Dictionary, which according to its publisher is the most widely cited law book in the world, uh, gives us a good definition. Uh, something in which the public as a whole has a stake. Something in which the public as a whole has a stake. Uh, so the question becomes here, is the demo of the house at, at 61 Warner Street something in which the public as a whole has a stake? And I think the answer is yes, indeed. There's been a lot of discussion from other people uh, about the, the, uh, the neighborhood. Um, all, the, all the houses from our house at uh, kind of the top of the hill at 129 all the way down to the end on the north side in particular, were all mill workers houses almost. There's, there's, there may be one or two other houses that, that aren't. And so they've all been changed over the years and added to and stuff, but the core of each house is still this mill workers house. And as um, uh, uh, Chris and Deborah pointed out, the value of particularly these houses. So um, to go to one of those uh, lists of other get evidence that could be gathered, uh, which is the streetscape. We also know the house is an important piece in the general flow of the streetscape um, in its own block because there's so many houses that are very similar to it. And so there's a coherence to the streetscape with that house there. And as a connector to the adjacent block across from Hinkley Street, which if you keep going up, you find uh, several houses that have form B's form for, uh, done for those. Plus we also know, and or we must, we got to assume that uh, Mr. Hansel intends to demolish the house and build uh, three modern 35 foot tall houses on this small property, uh, similar to the two houses he's currently constructing near the corner of Warner and Federal. 
uh, such massive expensive houses will not fit into this historical streetscape and will instead lead to its further disintegration. So as so many people have pointed out, we clearly, the public as a whole in our neighborhood and the city has a stake in whether the demolition of this house proceeds. So please vote for the public interest or rather than his private interest, please vote yes and designate this house as a properly preserved building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Jackie. You need to unmute yourself, Jackie. There. Perfect. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to uh, point out that some of Mr. O'Hara's photographs were misleading. One I noticed as um, Chris did that he showed a wall that said this is ordinary construction, but it was in fact a wall of the addition, not a wall of the original house. And the shots he showed of the interior that looked like they were demolished were in fact under demolition, as I understand it, by the previous owner when he and his wife, oh, they used to have beautiful flower gardens in the front. They were, they were house proud people and they were in the process of renovating that house when they split up. And the day that they moved out, their, their, their son came down and stayed in my yard. He was so heartbroken to be leaving his home to that his mom and dad were splitting up. He was going to new school, but that house was not in bad condition because it was let be deteriorated. It was in fact undergoing renovation. Oh. And I'm also familiar with um, Joseph Day and his family when they lived at 61 Federal, the Slattery family lived in my house at 35 Warner Street. I said Federal, I meant Warner. It's on the corner. Corner lots are so desirable. Um, when my friend Mary Lou bought this house at 35 Warner in 1975, she was immediately proud of the fact that it was a mill house and has spent years researching the families that lived here and the changes in construction, the additions different families have added on. And the fact that there are these, this is one of the, the four so-called identical houses, which are not to be dismissed because they were built identical. Each house has been here for more than a century and families have added on a, some, one house has a front porch, one house has a back porch, another house has a craftsman stairway, another house has a big rear deck. They're all different and distinctive and they tell the lives of the people who live here. And I know that if 61 Warner Street were renovated by someone who likes to do that sort of thing, the family that gets that house and puts life into it again will have themselves a gem, an absolute gem. You could take that funky old garage, build it, rebuild the garage with a nice in-law apartment over, you've increased how, so added some affordable housing and then sell the land intact, save the cherry tree. I think I've made my points. Thank, Thank you. you, Jackie. Anybody else? Oh, excuse me. What the thing? Is it Josh? Hi, guys. Josh Silver. I am not. Uh, I'm at 117 Maplewood Terrace. I'm not in the diplomatic room at the White House at the tiny desk. Just want to be clear. <laughs> it's a Zoom background. Um, I just want to say that, you know, the thing that's striking to me is that it feels like, you know, there's tasteful historical modifications to houses to make them work for you. And there's not tasteful. My house was built in 1864. As some of you might know, it's the yellow house. We put, uh, uh, we took down the old deck or porch and rebuilt it in the same footprint. We added an extra floor on top of a single floor that was our kitchen but like we never dreamed of like raising the house and you know completely changing the characteristic of the neighborhood and nor should anybody in a place like Bay State and so it's particularly problematic when somebody wants to come in and completely decimate the aesthetic of the neighborhood which there's nothing else like that around absent the new development farther down Hinkley which is pretty far away and I didn't know that was happening, but be that as it may, I just think this is like 
a bad move. I'm not, not nearly as sophisticated as a lot of the commenters here, but like it is not in, it's not comporting with the historical sort of aesthetic of our neighborhood, the vibe, it's just really bad. And it seems kind of obvious that we should not let this happen. Uh, that's all, thanks. Thank you, Josh. Anybody else? Okay, if there are no other comments, um, we will give an opportunity for the applicant to respond. And then the commissioners to ask questions if they have any. So, um, is Ryan or John, either of those, uh, uh, either I'll, of you. I'll like go first, and then if Mr. Hansel has anything to add on top of what I said, he, he's welcome. Okay. To um, first, to address just a, a factual point, that photograph of the inside of the walls is of the addition. However, since the information raised at the uh, public meeting on the determination of historical significance, Mr. Hansel has, has done some drilling like not core samples is the wrong word but into the walls to to check if that's the case around the home nowhere is there any brick in the walls of this home and mr hansel can confirm that for himself so while i understand and, and i believe it's it's mr thompson and ms berkowitz have told you what's going on in their house at 41 warner that house isn't 61 warner uh second to address uh, you know another point that was raised here it, is I've had the opportunity, someone was just talking about tasteful modifications to these homes. I've had the opportunity to drive up and down Warner Street a, a good deal since I started getting involved in this and just over the course of my lifetime. And I can say that Mr. Thompson and Ms. Berkowitz have a beautiful home. It's obvious the care that they've put into it. And I don't know how much of it is modifications over the years or whatnot. And that home is a home that has what I would say some distinctive architectural characteristics, things that make it exceptional. And all you have to do is go look at their home from the outside and then go look at 61 to see why 61 is not a building that should be preferably preserved. If they are even of the same species of home, they are on opposite ends. I, I think that, you know, people, there's been some talk about being taken aback by the developer's presentation here. And, you know, any attacks on me in this meeting, that's fine. Uh, attacks on Mr. Hansel, I think I've had the opportunity to observe now three of these meetings and I really can't let it go without saying something. Uh, it's gotten to a point where you just have the same host of people showing up and attacking, not the actual projects, not the standards the commission is supposed to apply, but the developer himself, the company, you hear attacks on the city's rules. And these are personal vitriolic, frankly, attacks. And what you're not hearing one thing is anyone from outside this neighborhood coming in and saying this structure is important to the city and important to its history. You're not hearing any architect that doesn't own a home, any construction professional that doesn't own something right there coming and saying that this is a historically significant preservable building. And to the same degree that you're being called to examine Mr. Hansel and New Way Homes motives and intentions, I just ask you to seriously consider the motives and intentions that you're hearing, because what's become apparent is in every single thing this developer tries to do in the city, you're going to have these same people here fighting against him, whatever the issue is. And while I greatly respect the passion the, everyone has for their community and their neighborhood, sincerely, I, I do. I think at some point on specific issues, like when you're talking about these nine factors, and this structure and its actual condition and what makes it, if anything, unique and architecturally significant. You have to question whether one, a lot of the evidence that you're hearing in this public hearing actually is at all relevant or directed at that issue. And two, whether it's really sincerely motivated by a belief that this is a historically significant structure and not this overall campaign against Mr. Hansel, his company and his developments that is ongoing and you, you've seen for yourselves tonight the level of vitriol and passion that's directed towards against him and any of his representatives. So, you know, I'm happy to answer any of the board's questions about the demolition permit, about the criteria of the ordinance. I, I don't believe you've heard anything across of this meeting that tells you that this is a structure that's in, in any sort of good condition, that this is a structure 
that is in any way exemplary of architecture. And, and I would just urge and remind the commission that we're talking now about the structure itself and whether this structure is preferably preserved. And whatever tangential historical relevance has been raised is simply not significant enough to find on a preponderance of these criteria that this is a preferably preserved structure, that it's better for the public interest of the city of Northampton to have this vacant home sit around, fall further into disrepair over the next year. And respectfully for that reason and everything that's been argued tonight, I'd ask that you find that it is not a preferably preserved structure. Thank you, Ryan. John, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I do. I'm very taken back by the fact of what people tell me I'm supposed to do here as far as more land, because Deb thinks everybody's supposed to have it this way. That's her vision. My vision is having more families in the neighborhood that enjoy the, enjoy the neighborhood. That's, and that's the way I see it. I don't see myself as destroying it, but that's the way she sees it because that's the way she wants to keep the neighborhood. That's what she moved into and she's supposed to keep it her way. Not one person's vision is always right. And so I don't think that, I'm just taken back by it. It's like, I got my piece of the pie. I don't want anybody else to have a piece of the pie. And with all these people that share how I should do this, how I should do this project, it's, it's, uh, that's, their, that's their point. That's their opinion, I should say. It doesn't mean that they're right. It doesn't mean, you know, everybody has an opinion. And, and Martha, I just don't think that that's the correct way. We're supposed to be first talking about the house, whether it is historical and everything was, in my point, off track. They think the house should be done, developed this way. They think it should be developed that way. And there's nothing historical about the house. I went to the house and even though the, uh, her partner says hers is with uh, brick and everything, I went to the rest of the house. I didn't see anything there. Her house is not my house. And to, and to assume something is incorrect. So I, I don't, like I said, I'm just taken back by the whole thing. And I really don't know what to say here because of that. And that's why I let Ryan do the talking because and I just don't like when people say that this is how it's supposed to be. If we did everything, everybody has a different view of it. And I see the families coming in. I know that people buy my houses and they're all happy with them. So it's just, like I said, I just think it's a slander. I think it's gang mentality. It's a mob mentality. And that's about it. It's, that's what it is. Okay, John, thank you. We, um, I think the commissioners would agree with me. We, you know, we are really, focused on the matter at hand, which is the, the structure and um, the evidence that we have laid out in front of us. Um, and so I, I greatly appreciate all that, um, you know, Ryan, you, John have um, contributed to this as well as all of the many people that attended. Um, at this point, uh, I would ask if any of the commissioners have additional questions for either the applicant or any of the uh, participants, the attendees. Um, Dylan, Barbara, Craig. Um, I don't have any questions. Are, are we having a discussion about this as well? Or because we will, we have to public close the hearing first. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, I don't think I have any questions. No. Okay, Dylan. I do not. Craig. Are you there? Yes, I am here. I have no questions. Okay. Well, in that case, um, again, thank you, everyone. We are going to officially close the hearing. All right, all right done. We're done. Here. And um, you're welcome. Yeah. You know, folks are welcome to stick around. Uh, we uh, will be having a discussion now um, about the project. Um, taking two actions, well, possibly two actions. So, um, so commissioners. <laughs> uh, Martha, if uh, if the commission agrees that no additional information is needed, can I just get a motion to close the hearing officially? Oh, yes, of course. Does anyone I, I would, want to make a motion would, to close the hearing? I would move that we bring the public hearing portion of our meeting to a close. Okay. Second that. Still in. And we need to vote on that. Any other discussion? Okay, Sarah. Martha? Yes, to close. Dylan? Yes. Craig? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. 
All right, so um, our next move is, um, this is our situation. Um, we first need to um, decide, but based on the evidence, um, whether we believe this house should be properly preserved. If that is a positive vote, yes, then we would follow up with um, the vote about a delay. So um, I, I'm happy to take a motion on that and then we could have some more discussion. That would be, um, that would be the way to do it. Does anyone I'd be, want glad, to I'd be glad to move that the house at 61 Warner Street be declared preferably preserved. Okay, any second? I'll second that. Dylan, okay. Discussion. I think it's different, Barbara. Oh, okay, I can, I can start, I guess. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm really glad that um, even though, you know, there are strong feelings on on um, both sides. I'm really glad to have both points of view presented and, um, or many points of view, not just both, not just two points of view, and to get more information about the cultural and uh, the social history of the house, how it fits in with the neighborhood and what, what, it's, what I feel it's a part of. And I think that um, the, uh, as you even said, when you were reading the nine um, criteria that we can use to judge whether something's preferably preserved, that just because it isn't architect, we, even if we don't feel that the architecture is significant or unique, and a lot of these houses do have changes over the years, I think that much more compelling is the um, cultural history of this house and the people who both developed the whole area and built this house and presumably three and three other houses in, uh, near each other on Warner Street. So um, I think that it's very strong on that, on that um, criterion of cultural, social, historical significance. And also I think that, I, I should point out, because I think people don't realize that this is called a demolition delay ordinance, even though people refer to it as, uh, oh gosh, what is it? <laughs> they say it's demolition, um, Sorry, it's, um, but it, it's not, it, it's meant to provide some more time, one for people to correct, to collect information, but it could also, we wanna provide time for a house we think should be preferably preserved for people to come forward. If, if somebody really has somebody who's interested in buying this house, that it's a time to have a discussion with the builder or the current owner um, and, uh, to move forward with other things. It gives people time, as I said, for discussion. And it doesn't have to be 12 months. The, 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 um, the ordinance says up to 12 months. So right. if some kind of resolution is, is, is come to, then the commission can lift the delay um, before the 12 month period. Thank you, Barbara, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Dylan. Yeah. Um... I, I think many members of the public spoke very eloquently, um, particularly to the criteria of what is the building or structure, structure's role in the streetscape and the cultural history. And I think that those two are really interwoven here in this case, um, not to go further into the history, um, but just as a little background into who Porter Nutting was, um, who developed this area. Um, Porter Nutting owned the land from Cooley Dickinson all the way down to the paper mill. Um, he bought this land. He himself was an abolitionist. He became a, an abolitionist at the age of 16. He very much was related to, um, socially to Samuel Hill and the people in Florence um, for whom we are establishing a historic district, working towards establishing a historic district. Um, he built these houses and we really have this, this nice example of what the mill village looked like at that time. And it remarkably remains a working class village and has stayed, kept a lot of the character. And I think these, these houses particularly reflect that. Um, I, he was a brick maker, his brick factory was down at the bottom of the high school hill. 
um, he was connected to William Fennell Pratt, who was the most famous local architect. He, uh, but it was behind the scenes, similar to the working class people in this neighborhood. Um, Samuel, or Porter Nutting provided the bricks and was a builder and contractor for the state hospital for most of the brick buildings downtown that were built prior to 1885 um, for city hall, for the first churches. I mean, this is a prominent person in our town, but he was a tradesman, he was a working class figure. Um, so I think that it's fitting that, you know, this neighborhood that he laid out, which remains a working class neighborhood with affordable houses, um, I know because I sold a house one street over my family's home for an extremely affordable price. I myself have lived in Northampton all my life. Um, I was able to buy a house here that was run down, very old house and slowly fix it up like we've heard. Um, I'd also wanna mention that I take exception to the idea that people would walk by this house and not see the history. I've led and participated in walking tours all over Bay State and Florence and downtown Northampton where hundreds of people walk by common houses and we talk about the history that's inside of them. We talk about the history of what is now covered with aluminum siding, but the history that we've learned of the people who live there and what it means. I think there's a context to Bay State history and I think that this section of Warner Street speaks particularly well to that context. So that's all. Thanks, John. Craig. Here goes. This, um, I heard quite a bit tonight, and I love, love the idea of all the neighbors coming out in mass, because this will be a cataclysmic moment here, you know, as, as my time a historic president on the historical commission. I've seen a few important hearings come up. Alex Jarrett mentioned 205 Nonatuck Street. Well, that was iconic. That was the first time that a demolition delay review came up that we actually stepped up to ensure that the building would not be torn down. And that's at 205 Nonatuck. That's where the David Ruggles Center for Early Florence History and Underground Railroad Studies is. So important in the context of the last 18 months. And the first live workplace in the city came about because we saved the ubiquitous forgotten little 1300 foot one bathroom house. Another iconic thing that took place recently, more recently, that was just uh, the building we lost on King Street, the most historic house in the city, some would say, the Erastus Hopkins house, which was turned by, turn, uh, torn down by the diocese. And the moment we voted it to be preferably preserved, they went on a one year time clock. And when the thing timed out, the excavator started up and it was torn down. Just recently this week, if you haven't been down there, you should see the beautiful new parking lot that was built in its place, a paved parking lot. The other uh, thing mentioned here, uh, someone mentioned down on Old South Street, the house that was torn down for a parking lot for the little convenience store at the corner of Conn Street. Well, my memory of that was very notable. That's how we got the demolition delay ordinance passed in the city because it was so painful for people on their commuter route out of town to see the building get torn down board by board by board. Every day you saw less of it and put onto a flatbed trailer or two that then went to New Hampshire. And then the guy who did that actually mismarked the boards and couldn't reassemble it. So then it gets sold and goes back up to, New, to Williamsburg to be reassembled and sold for close to three quarters of a million dollars. So that's just one of the strange things that happens here. But 
this, I was very, very pleased to see everybody here. Uh, and thank you, Councillor Jarrett, for coming. John Hansel is, an, is a nice, honorable guy. I know him. I know his work is high quality. But this is, um, some, he's overturned the hornet's nest on this one. This is going to create change in Northampton. I create change all over the Commonwealth. You see my bridge behind me? I bought that bridge to keep it from being demoed. In fact, I bought three and a half miles of dead railroad and three rare bridges. This is the last of its type still standing. And it, the big cataclysmic change that came about because of this, DOT is slowed down in the sales of dead railroad. And this will now be a part of the hundred mile trail. It will be the longest rail trail in the Northeast because what I did was change the, the, the direction of things. And this, what happened tonight, there will be a change in directions here. The form B's that have been mentioned here um, throughout the last couple of meetings, the form B's were, were, were foisted upon by this, onto the cities and towns of Massachusetts by the Massachusetts Historical Commission to write narratives about all the more famous older historical properties in a given community. Form S was for structures like the structure behind me. But the form B's in Northampton, there's a couple of thousand, I think, but they're not complete. Your task now is to take part, there has to be a big community project here to redo or to improve the inventory of all the form B's. All the historic houses in Bay State that haven't been that haven't been inventoried need to be inventoried. Here's a little bit of useless information you probably knew, didn't know. You know that there's 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth. What you probably don't know is that there's 1400 plus little hamlets or unincorporated villages in these cities and towns that live on the Secretary of State's website. If you go in there onto the website, plug in unincorporated cities and towns, you will see Bay State Village, along with a myriad of other places you never know existed. All of those places are ripe for Form B inventory creations. You need to do this. And I've, I've heard over the last several months here about this issue on Landy Avenue, on, on Warner. People feel blindsided by this process and there has to be a cohesive outreach to the city. How that happens, I do not know. I am not the expert, but I do know that the Bay State Village Association, one of several village associations that have come to be in the city, needs to take the lead on this and needs to improve the reporting so people don't feel steamrolled or blindsided by these things. And so there can be a more thoughtful discussion before it becomes panicked and, and the clock ticking down on you. And it's just, that's what I would like to see. I, I, I too have been in the little house on, on uh, 61 Warner. It's encased in vinyl siding. And I like to say that vinyl is never final. It can be restored. And I know about restoring old Civil War era houses since mine at 62 Chess Street is one of nine built by the Florence Sewing Machine Factory to house the department heads to stay with us and don't go off to war. We'll build you all free houses. Well, that's a pretty notable thing. And I love living in the village center. And I can sense people love living in Bay State Village. And um, once again, thank you for coming out tonight. I hope you continue on to what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Okay, um, I just want to echo 
um, what the fellow commissioner said, I uh, agree with all of it. And it was also stated so, um, so clearly and forcefully, um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And um, so I, I don't wanna add any more comment. Uh, I think everything has been said and unless any of the commissioners have anything more to add, I think we should, um, I should entertain a motion. And this would be to either um, determine the house to be properly preserved or not. I, I did make that motion already, Martha. This oh, you did, discussion. I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost in your, I was lost in your, um, yes, thank you. I think that's what I think I did. Sorry, uh, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Yeah, to that's right. Thank you, Barbara. The okay. House preferably preserved. Thanks. So um, uh, then I think we should vote. So Sarah. Martha? Uh, I vote um, yes to preferably, pres preferably preserve. Dylan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Craig? Yes. All right, that is unanimous. Given that, um, when then we have a second vote that we need to entertain, um, and this would be uh, a vote to um, determine that no building permit shall be issued for up to 12 months to confirm that. And just to also restate what Barbara had said is that um, this is an up to 12 months. And if it gives time to do more research, to look at alternatives, and if, um, uh, there is a, a change in that period of time. The commission can rescind that um, that twelve months um, if if they so uh, deem it to be um, appropriate. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we enact the demolition delay for twelve months. Second. Anyone? I would. Um, if I want to amend that, do I second it first and just say that I think it should be up to 12 months? Thank you. To honor the, the language of the uh, statute. Yes, I believe that is the language of the ordinance. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. Okay. So, Sarah? Martha? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Craig? Yes. Motion passed. All right. It's seven o'clock, commissioners. I don't know if we want to, we do have a few other uh, items on the agenda that we may want to um, table for now, unless Sarah, you think that's something we do need to uh, address tonight. Uh, I don't have anything that can't wait until January. Okay. Thank right, you all so for your time. Right, then um, is there any mail that we need to review? There is not. Okay, so I'm um, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. I move to adjourn the meeting. Second, anybody? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a separate vote. Okay, Bye. great.